parts of our constructs, ego constructs in Western society can can really fear or the connotations with emptiness. Like, I don't want to feel empty. Yeah. I want fulfillment, right? Fulfillment, fulfillment yeah. right? Yeah. Because the construct is so addicted to the filling of the space, right? What if we thought about it in this way, right? Where we come to the realization that absolutely everything has been born out of, everything that exists has been born out of that space. Every thought, every idea, any like, any physical bit of matter has come from that space, right? Relationship has come from a nothing. So is that no a no thing, right? A thing that then exists within all of the space of no things. That's integral developmental coach, speaker, facilitator, Dan Kolapsky. And you're listening to The Beginning of Us. I feel like something is rapidly transfiguring in my core being, an awakening of sorts. The Beginning of Us. A raw conversation hosted by your main fucker, Billy Otto. Pulling apart what it means to rebirth, to rewild, to be curious, and to rechild. Hey, world! It's been a while, but we're back on. Are you pumped? Fam, it's so good to be back. I've just had a week off doing some deep healing, some ceremony work. Um, I've been in the bush. Um, but I'm back and I've been really excited to share some new conversations with you. I want to check in with you guys. How are you going? I'm sure it's been a real, very real couple of weeks for you with COVID and all the changes, climate action, climate inaction, the ups and downs, the throes of life, the inner battles, relationships. Wow. How can we find stillness and peace and all of that? I read from uh, Lao Tzu, the father of Taoism, just a couple of days ago, that he, he penned this beautiful quote that says, to the mind that is still, the whole universe surrenders. Powerful, finding that stillness. Some of you may have heard about the Tambor Project, a project that is all about bringing musicians together for rewilding the planet. Um, how good is the idea of carbon neutral music? Wow. Kyle Leinhardt, myself, Mandala Barker have made this song called Our Song and you can stream it everywhere. It's on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, Deezer. Share it with your friends. Please share it on your, your stories. With 100,000 streams, we can make this song project completely carbon neutral and we've got some data, some analytics on that. But all the proceeds post that 100,000 streams um, go straight towards Wild Ark. Yeah, regreening, rewilding our fragile planet. I'm super excited about this um, conversation with Dan Kolapsky. You would have just heard his voice before. Uh, he's a powerful organization, yes, and uh, changing the way we see social entrepreneurship, self-work, and regenerative living. You can find his organization in the show notes. He's just a beautiful man, and he's definitely been one of those brothers that has helped me to evolve in my course. So... No more chin wagon from Bilbo. I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. This is Dan Kolapsky. The beginning of us. I'm with the Polish Jesus of Bondi. The co-owner of iMove Physios. The creator of Yes And. A man oozing of wise words and thoughtful reflection. A meditation teacher extraordinaire. Keynote speaker integral developmental coach, speaker, facilitator, Dan Kolapsky. <laughs> Welcome to the beginning of us, bro. It's such an honor to have you on my podcast. Thank you so much for having me, legend. <laughs> so psyched to be with you, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Literally the last hour and a half I've just spent with Dan, just chilling on the back of my deck, just sipping chai teas and just, just relishing in brotherhood, in ascension in transcendence and just frothing on birds and good times. It's been so relaxing, man. I felt really still and I've just learned so much from the last hour and a half already. I wish I kind of press recorded, but I'm still surrendered to the fact that we didn't record. Yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. And, um, I know that everything that's supposed to come out will come out now. How are you, bro? What's been happening? Good brother. 
And uh, that last hour and a half felt like five, hey? I know. Yes. <laughs> so good. Um, yeah, I'm really good, mate. Uh, like I said, um, we've been talking about ha having this yarn and finally getting one of our own yarns that we have so often bumping into each other so randomly uh, in town uh, to actually get get those happening on on one of these podcasts hey yeah oh good dan honestly bro i tell you all the time but you're one of the few people in my weird malaysian busy life and i'm like fuck like i need to spend more time with that guy i feel very very loved when i'm around you i feel like my my craft is honored my journey is honored and you are like a beautiful deep listener yeah, I feel like you really honour um, people's words around you and um, from just being friends with you for the last two years, I've just really felt like a deep a deep brotherhood connection and, and definitely you've, you've, you've helped to filter out the noise for me about a lot of to toxic masculinity as well, like really coming in to my vulnerability and embracing my, my sacred masculine. And um, I, I really appreciate the thoughts that you bring to the table and especially the movement that you've created in Australia and abroad. And yeah, man. So, um, yeah, I really want to honor you as like a beginning point. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Um, as always, Hey, super beautiful words coming from you. And, uh, uh, you know, over the last two years, again, that's felt like such an expansive time that, you know, to think that we've only known each other for, for two years and, um, you know, we were just talking about how there's been so much growth, development, evolution for, for both of us, hey. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we were reflecting on uh, the first time I met you and like how I was quite a different being at that mm -hmm. point in time mm -hmm. and, and uh, the way that you saw me at that point in time and the way that I saw you at that point in time and, and how we've evolved since then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, interacting with you um, every time I bump into you or have a chat with you, um, it seems as though that interaction is deepening each time. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> it's unreal. Like, you, you know, you're, the place that you're coming from uh, in, in speaking truth, um, your truth and, uh, yeah, it's beautiful, mate, and and this is infinite, hey. Yeah. This uh, this this process is 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 a forever process, yeah. and so it's super cool to to think that um, we could really say that this is only just the beginning, hey. Yeah, definitely, yeah. man. Yeah, 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 man. I want to. I'm. I really do believe that even like two two and a half years ago when we first connected, that we we're both in very different spaces, and particularly for yourself, like um, I sense that you're on a journey. And um, the first time, listeners, that I met Dan, I was playing a house show at his place in Bondi. It was called The Shamrock and him and he's one of his best na best mates and a good mate of mine, Benny Wallington, and he's got a podcast as well. He, um, he and Dan were running this epic backyard show, ticketed event, and, like, I rocked up in my Suzuki Swift <laughs> with all this, like, PA gear in the back, a little bit stressed out. I'd never really, like, hung out with you guys before. And I was just piling all this gear in. I was just giving you guys hugs. And um, it was an awesome time. But, man, like I feel like the journey that you've been on is really um, interesting and captivating to me because I do believe at this stage that you you haven't gone overseas yet. You hadn't gone to uh, Peru um, for your ayahuasca trip. And I would love to, to go a little bit into psychedelics in this episode. But, um, you know, going back to your foundations up to that point, you grew up in Sydney. Um, both your parents are from Poland or just your dad? And my dad and my mum's from the Czech Republic. Czech, yeah. 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 Um, Eastern European. Yeah. 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 16 to, was it 16 to 24, you just had this drive and it was like it was your world and it was your chance to kind of expand your territory and make your mark and, yeah, you are quite a driven young man, correct? Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, you know, the, the mindset... I'll make this happen um, was definitely a huge driver. I'll make this thing called life happen. Whilst being a, a, a mini rebellion as a 16-year-old against my dad, <laughs> kind of like, hang on a second. So 
you're telling me that if you buy me my first car that you can tell me what to do and yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, and totally. that you can you can sort of tell me all the things I need to be doing and, and I was just like no way I sat parents down and I was like hey guys um I can't afford to keep a roof over my head or put food on the table but everything else I'm going to take care of on my own mm. so if you could continue <laughs> that sort of stuff like keeping a roof over my head that'd be unreal but uh um yeah so I went on this m- mini rebellion and um I'm forever grateful right now that like you know in that interaction with my dad that that you know the place that he was coming from was out of absolute love and care um and and there were a lot of beautiful things that were born out of me sort of really taking life on in that very uh you know masculine driving achieving way um and it absolutely had its own limitations which i sort of you know it's where a lot of the work had been kicked off as in mm. hang on what's happening here what's going on here and um you know bringing a bit of awareness to to a, to a lot of what was happening in the world or to my you know in my world in that sense mm. but uh yeah yeah cuz we're talking about how like <clears throat> completely there's nothing wrong with that innate primal drive and i think it's part of our evolution like and you know our neanderthalic part of our being that it's just about you know survival forward focused building it's like we're building these empires it's kind of beautiful and i think without that drive we don't come to a deeper understanding of of awareness and but i think it was a bit later on that you began to see that there's also there is a spiritual realm and understanding softness and not just boldness yeah that's that's the practice now for me. Yeah. Like, you know, if we're if we're talking about the practice being a forever practice, right now for me, it's uh, how do I how do I uh, go for life fully, fully be yeah. bold on the on the complete end of the spectrum of boldness, while simultaneously being on the complete end of the spectrum of softness. Yeah. Like. How can that dichotomy actually that can that exist, right? And I've it's an art. I've seen it in action, you know, with mm. a couple of humans in my life, and um, yeah, for, for me now to be able to uh, to to live life uh, with that boldness mm. and that softness at the same time is, you know, it's a healthy integration of that masculine feminine energy, um, mm. uh, not, not one overriding the other. Uh, not excessive masculine or excessive feminine, but uh, having them, you know, work as a team together, which is, uh, mm. yeah, and it's natural to us, right? It's just that, like, somewhere along the way in life, in response to particular situations, like maybe in response to my dad or maybe in response to mm. something that happened at school or whatever else, the the excessive masculine or excessive feminine can come into play. Mm. Um, and And then, you know, that that falls into an awareness for us, whatever it is for each human being, right? Mm. Um, the imbalance or whatever, uh, mm. that falls into a, an awareness. Uh, and then, you know, the choice is left to each of us to be like, cool, what do I do with this now? Yeah. What did that um, <clears throat> that paradigm kind of look like for you in high school and the relationship that you, that you had with your dad and with your mom growing up in like an Eastern European kind of cultured Australian home um you know what did you kind of see as as your current theme and paradigm and um and yeah what did you see your narrative kind of looking like at that time so funny Billy because as you were asking that question my my mind was almost it went to search for what that paradigm (laughs) was and and I was like, hey, <laughs> shit, that's, um, it's been a while since I've look, looked into that. <laughs> I was like, hang on a second, where is it? Is it still there? Yeah. And uh, what it was, it was, it was really, I was always going to university. Yeah. Yeah, from the age of five, I was going to go to university, yeah. right? Like you, you, had, you had family asking whether it was birthdays or Easter or Christmas or whatever mm. else, you had 
you had family asking, cool, so what are you going to be when you grow up? And, mm. you know, I, was, I loved my football, my, my soccer back then. I'd be like, I want to be a soccer player. And they'd be like, yeah, and you're going to go to university, right? Yeah. You're going to get an education. And after that, you're going to, you know, have a house, find yourself a nice Polish girl. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to uni because that's, you know, if you don't go, I wasn't sure what I thought of not going to uni. I don't think I didn't, there wasn't anything toxic around that, but uh, there was definitely a uh, weighing into or a lot of weight held in, in going to uni for that education. And well, fuck, if I didn't do that, then um, yeah, the family would kind of be, probably be asking questions and probably one side of the family more than the other be asking mm. questions around, well, are you taking life seriously and and what are you making of your life and yeah. and so on and so on. So, yeah, and, you know, uh, my dream as a kid was to play, either play or work in top-level sport, football. Mm. Mm. Um, just loved football in that sense and it's where I learnt a lot of my, say, you know, developed a lot of my resiliency or, or mm. mindset stuff. My dad would sit me in front of the TV as a six, seven or eight-year-old and have me watch Bruce Lee movies mm. or, or mm. you know, the Karate Kid or whatever it was with a specific intention to, to teach me that, you know, never say die or never give up attitude mm. kind of thing. And so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I feel like you kind of followed that model to a T because you had a nice car for a while as well. Like you kind of went through that path. You built, you went to uni, you built a business and you kind of, there were, like you were seemingly successful in that realm, you know, kind of playing your cards right. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like there was a game and you were playing it. But it came to a point where you noticed there was, there was like a piece of the puzzle, puzzle that wasn't really being seen and, and surfacing. And, yeah, I want to know about that point of the journey, like where you started to question that narrative and question that paradigm, mm. the one, the story that you'd been taught. Yeah. Um, that actually came, th came through uh, in my first business partnership. Yeah. You know, and I'd, I'd achieved that dream, that boyhood dream of, of working at the the top level of football in the country um, as a physiotherapist back then, and I was in business partnership with my you know it was my first business partnership for a physiotherapy clinic, and uh, you know with the earn with the money that was being earned, I was kind of I remember thinking oh well looking to decide well now that that's being earned what money what what car am I going to buy and yeah. all the, all that sort of stuff and and. Uh, one of the most beautiful gifts that was handed to me at that point in time was, um, you know, that business partnership turned into something or everything that a partnership shouldn't be. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about transparency around finances or transparency around the work being done and communication, all that sort of stuff. And and so um, as I started to become aware of that, I was like, well, hold on a second, like, okay, this, uh, I've got to come up with a plan B here. And so that's how that sec the second clinic I moved, I started like that idea started to come through, but I didn't know if I wanted to do that with someone or on my own. And if I'm not in football anymore, then who am I? Like yeah, it, was, yeah. it was such a big part of my identity, yeah. like football physio with this top football team and so on. And I dreamt that for so long as a kid and, and, uh, yeah, that's at that point I had met, but I just knew I didn't, the way that this partnership was going, I didn't want to be involved and, and go through life in that way. Mm. And, you know, I was working 14 hours a day, uh, seven days a week with, you know, there may have been a 24 hour window between Saturday, Sunday, that there was no work, but that was happening for seven months straight. And, um, but I didn't have a family. I didn't, mm. I didn't, uh, I didn't have a girlfriend or whatever at that point in time. So I didn't have kids. And so I was like, it's okay. But then I realized that my twenties are as important as my thirties, my forties, my fifties, mm. my sixties, whatever else. And yeah, um, called up, called up a, uh, a friend from uni and, um, he was in a very same space, you know, very similar space of looking to uh, create something for himself in his life. And, um, but live in a different way, more purposeful way. And um, that's where we met up and 
we were just on the same page as to what we wanted to create. And that was I Move Physio and, you know, that's still running now. And then, you know, a big part of, a big part of uh, my life at that point in time was that gung ho approach was definitely at play with business, with work, uh, and with my partying, right? Mm. And um, it was around that same period that we started the second business that I really started to delve into meditation, but it was this weird, um, uh, it was actually a relationship, a three month thing that I was, I went so deep into. And then all of a sudden, um, that wasn't happening anymore. I was just, you know, in quite an emotional state. My best mate was like, why don't you try meditation? Mm. And I was like, what do you mean? Sit there with my legs crossed and my fingers like this. And what am I supposed to do? So on and so on. He kind of ran me through it, did it. And then did a beginner's course in meditation, intermediate course in meditation, did a 10 day silent meditation retreat. Mm. I was just like, whoa, Mm. like this needs to be taught to the world. But what was happening was I had this practice that I was developing whilst at the same time, it's not like life switched over immediately. Mm. At the same time, I was working, running a business and partying like there was no tomorrow and doing all of these things at the same time. And so, yeah, it was a really interesting period and it's interesting how, you know, we speak of when we first met and <laughs> and it and it almost feels like the beginning beginning of all time, like when yeah. when we had first met and the evolution since then. But, you know, that evolution, it's kind of consistent in all of our stories and and has has evolved for everyone in a completely different way. And uh um yeah. and and it's never like it can be a, a single moment in time that form everything shifted and changed but that only only happens as a as a as an a a momentary awareness of reality as it is and then we need to shed and clear a lot of the Mm. conditionings that we've had that brought us into that situation so you have an awakening versus growing up right and there's a difference between the two there and this awakening was, yeah, like you're saying, it didn't happen overnight. There was like, it was like this voice was speaking through certain amounts of events. And so you're pursuing the spiritual journey, but still living the same lifestyle. Yeah. And just like, just making it work and sleeping X amount of hours a night, just getting up, doing this, you know, just plowing through it. And, but somehow you felt like, fuck, I need to, you know, like I've heard of ayahuasca. Like how did that come into the story? Mm. So ayahuasca, you know, those parting ways, they they started to uh, distill and mm. slow down a little. You know, I was getting, I was, what was that, 27, 28. And, but it, they were still definitely there. And uh, Benny and I had <laughs> enjoyed, you know, a few nights out and that sort of stuff like together. He probably um, got to witness my final days of, of full blown partying, which was yeah. which was super super cool, you know, to like to have those moments, right? But um, uh, there was this yearning to to go deeper. It's interesting because when I speak to the growing up, the growing up is the conditioning and the default mode that you know our behaviors, behavioral patterns, our thinking patterns that that mm. are what drive a lot of what we're doing every mm. day. And what's interesting is we have an awareness of some of the shit that we're doing that we kind of know that's not good for us and we would like to change, but why is it not that easy to change that yeah. stuff? And mm. it's because of how how ingrained those patterns are in our unconscious mind. Um, and so I had that awareness. I had that awareness around you know, whether, but I didn't really feel my, my, you know, the drinking habits were too different to a lot of, you know, 20 something year old males in Australia or whatever, but you know, that could be a generalization in itself, but I knew I wanted to change it. Hey. And, and, uh, um, you know, at this point I'd done that one, uh, 10 day silent meditation retreat, the Yeah. 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 That was in Japan actually. And, um, can you just, um, 
underpin like what does that look like to to people that are listening for the first time a 10 day silent retreat because i didn't realize that you're supposed to be sitting down for the majority of the day right yeah and yeah you like you might have a break once an hour but you're sitting so basically it's a complete deprivation of stimulus um or almost complete deprivation of stimulus. So, mm. and when we're talking about stimulus, um, you know, it's it's anything from having a conversation to having your eyes open and and seeing and look being stimulated by what you're seeing, reading a book, mm. looking at your phone, whatever it might be. You rock up on day zero and um, and you. Uh, hand over all of your electronics you hand over anything you could write with so even that but it's Whoa. only it's only momentary right it sounds brutal it's like hey but it, you know couldn't i write like couldn't i couldn't i express myself in that way but we're so used to filling the space up mm. with something that we would you you know it's really an opportunity to spend 10 days in a way where you're not reaching to distract yourself from simply being with that stillness and mm. and it doesn't feel like stillness at first like you know the first day the first day because it's real cold turkey so uh you're spending 10 hours a day there's intervals so two hours at a time an hour at a time hour and a half at a time but cumulative you spend 10 hours in the day uh sitting with your eyes closed meditating there's a specific practice that you go through but you're meditating for 10 hours a day and your ego on that first day my <laughs> ego on that first day sits there and is in complete shock just going dude what are you doing mm. like i I'd, I'd done this twice so you know mm. you asked about ayahuasca i'd done it a second time in preparation for ayahuasca and i walked into it the second time around going done this before Mm. i'll be sweet Mm. and that first day was no different to the first day of that first time that i did the 10 day silent meditation retreat and i was sitting there just going even though i knew what to expect and even though i knew what it was all about that that voice that conditioned voice that's used to doing and doing and doing or like you know occupying itself or whatever Mm. else was just like i'm gonna leave i'm gonna walk out like I can't, they can't keep me here just because they've got my stuff. They can't keep me here. Mm. And as, that happened the first time around and the second time around. And that like, that voice, that energy, it's almost necessary for that part of the mind to eventually exhaust itself, Yeah. right? And it exhausts itself maybe a day and a half into it, two days into it. And when it does, because you haven't fed it, you couldn't feed it with anything. You couldn't feed it with any more stimulus. It's just silence. That's just space. Wow. And then from that space, you know, day three, both times, the amount of creativity that was coming through mm. um, because that space was not filled up with a whole bunch of stuff anymore, you know, in the mind, mm. headspace, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, from – from from business ideas, how can the business be more impactful and purposeful? And like all, just everything was coming through. I was just like, I started memorizing actually, uh, and I did this both times around. I started memorizing and keeping a mental journal, which may not have been what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to clear your mind, but mm. I started, and I would recite that that page that I'd mentally write as an as some points for myself. I'd recite that on day three. And then recite it on day four with day four, day four's worth of stuff, and then Dude. keep accumulating and so on. But yeah, ten days silent. I just want to speak into that for a moment because I feel like from the tradition that I've come from in Seventh Day Adventism, in my very conservative Christianity, which I've taken so many gems from, like love my Christian crew, like l- have loved my journey and and want to honor that. But one of the flaws that I feel now in my reflection of the story that I was told about spaciousness and solitude is that even when you are trying to create space for devotion by yourself, you are supposed to be praying for that time. And so prayer time and meditation in a biblical sense is very much so, Lord God, I thank you for today. You're going through these gratitudes. It's beautiful. And then you're declaring, you know, God's presence in your life. You're asking for forgiveness for for particular sins. Um, 
you are confessing your hatred towards your brother, you know, all these things, but you're constantly thinking, Mm. like you're constantly, and especially when it comes to shame, like I remember being 16, trying to create space in my life, like, fuck, I thought about boobs today. Oh, I really want to have sex. I feel so bad. Shame, cycle, spiral, Mm. um, feedback loop, Mm. toxicity. And I was constantly in my head. And so like trying to go for a walk, trying to create space. I felt this yearning to create space in my life, but I didn't really have a template that was more holistic. Mm. And so my spaciousness walking my dog, which was part of my meditation at the time, still was super noisy Um, and so much stimulus still around, even pre-social media, I was still always looking, thinking, sometimes getting a bit more into like a lucid dreamlike state, but still like thinking about my thoughts, thinking about God's thoughts towards me, trying to be Christian, trying to think of the Bible, thinking. And so you still come back from things like that, even a walk down the lake, trying to be spiritual, trying to be healthy, but you're still fucking noisy. Like you come back and you're not, your soul isn't energized. And I've never had so much, long story short, now that I'm 32, finally in what I believe to be a flow state. I feel like it's only because of spaciousness. Like I got out of Sydney because of the lack of spaciousness. Mm. Um, Geographical spaciousness leads to spiritual spaciousness. I think it's all partnered. It's all connected. And so when you're in a congested geography, a congested environment, hyper-concentrated, it's harder to really access that inner space and to be able to surrender to that void. And so now, man, like I fully listen to that Beatles lyric that says, turn off your mind, relax and float downstream. It's not dying. Surrender to the void. It is knowing. And it's just like, I, it's so hard to articulate because it just is living out of a space of surrender and active spaciousness. And so I haven't done it for the past one yet. I'm really excited to do a 10 day retreat, but like, I get to have a piece of that every morning and it's like part of my daily bread. Like I don't know how as a melancholy mind with the little amount of trauma that I've been through, how I would ever access that same amount of peace and, and, and flow state without that space. And then some people from different faith traditions be like, Oh, but that means you have to empty your mind. You have to just empty all these new ages about emptying. I'm like, No, it's just coming into a place of no mind. I'm not like tipping anything out. It's observing thoughts. It's like, (laughs) but it's like from the void comes life, man. It's like, it's crazy. You come out like I've just got this smile. I'm writing songs. I'm writing songs every day. Thank thankfulness to spaciousness. Like it's, yeah, man. So I'm feeling you. Absolutely, brother. And, and, you know, if, there's a particular thing about emptiness that um, uh, parts of our constructs, ego constructs in Western society can can really fear or the connotations with emptiness. Like I don't want to feel empty. Yeah. I want fulfillment, right? Feel, Full yeah. fulfillment, right? Yeah. Because the construct yeah. is so addicted to the feeling of the space, right? Yeah. What if we thought about it in this way, right, where we come to the realisation that Absolutely everything has been born out of, everything that exists has been born out of that space. Woo. Every thought, every idea, mm. any like... Every relationship. Any physical bit of matter has come mm. from that space, mm. right? Relationship has come from a nothing. So is that... A no thing. A no thing, yeah. right? A thing that then exists within all of the space of mm. no things. So um, I, I think if we really start to uh, develop a better relationship with with emptiness, with spaciousness, with um, stillness, uh, mm. I was listening to you speak earlier on. You were talking about how much you were frothing on just going back and doing the breath work or the sitting practice, the meditation and being in that stillness. And since Mm. you've come back from your ayahuasca journey, dropping into that stillness and you're just frothing on how, how you're able to be there in that stillness. And so 
the reason you've got this froth around that is because mm. you're spending time with with the thing that has existed before any matter or anything came into existence, including our own selves. Like that's that spaciousness was there. And that was the thing that was bearing witness to the thoughts that you were having when you were five years old. Mm. Right? What else? What like if you're having a thought, right? Who is it that can hear or see the thought that's being had? Mm. That's you, right? Mm. But that doesn't have anything to say per se in a noisy mm. way, right? It's it 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 expresses, mm. right? But it's that thing that was bearing witness to your thoughts when you were five. It's the same thing right now that's bearing witness to your thoughts now, but your fucking thoughts have changed, right? You're not having yeah. the same thoughts as what you were when you were five. And that's you because you've always been and therefore there's that decoupling of, of you from thought, right? Mm. I'm not my thoughts. And, you know, for some that might be obvious and for some not, you know, mm. you know I'm not my emotions because my emotions come and go. Yeah. So if you were your emotions, Strive. then you'd be coming and going as well. You're not coming, mm. going. You've always been there, right? So, um, dude, coming back to the Hebrew tradition, like the start of the Bible, the first chapter even talks about, and the earth was formless and without void. Mm. It's crazy to think about it now that even this creative force, yeah, before, before pre matter, mm. you know, and out of that, you know, and we see this in all through different like faith traditions and religions this thing of void and and things coming from a void like it's just but our consumptive capitalistic conveyor belt society is we are programmed to consume and that we need to consume we need more stuff we need to be more busy how you been fucking busy? oh yeah, yeah i've been pr- pretty fucking busy yeah, yeah yeah it's just kind of like why was that my default response mm. like needing to be needed needed to be wanted and to be moving I'm all about legs, but like legs ruled. That was my, that was the way that I measured my ROI, my KPI was just what I was doing, my output, you know, and just this walking GDP stat, you know. And you, you (laughs) say like, there was a word that you said there, consumptive, right? This consumptive society that we're in, one of consumerism or consuming And I think it's super, super important to touch on consuming isn't isn't the problem, right? Or like we can consume in a healthy way. When you eat, you consume. You're consuming. But it's the overconsumption, the excessiveness really. And uh, and the other thing that was coming up as you were speaking there was, you know, all of those behaviours that you were doing or whatever Mm -hmm. you were saying at that point in time, like, What's all of that on behalf of? Yeah. Right? What's it on behalf of? Like for 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 every human, the it it stems from a sense of disconnect. Mm. It stems from a sense of disconnect from another being or a situation. And that that disconnect is born out of that part of the brain, the ego, which is anything. Uh, that gives you the sense of self and other separateness, right? Mm. Whether you're feeling an inferiority or a superiority or blame or frustration or defensiveness or resistance, it's all defensiveness from something or resistance to something or superior over something or inferior to something under something. And so all of this creates that sense of separateness. And so when you when you're having that sense, even though, there's a connectedness that has always is always there, but when you've got that sense, when you when you're overridden by that ego construct, and you've got the sense of separateness, you're going to do everything you can to regain connectedness, mm. right? And that's where mm. um, that's where a lot of these behaviors of excessiveness come in to to somehow connect, and it's just uh, it's. You know, again, if we're talking about exhausting the construct, that energy to be doing something again and again, even though it's not working, if we allow that, it's cool. Allow mm. it because it'll exhaust itself as it does on day one, day two of the 10-day silent meditation yeah. retreat. And that energy sometimes is required to have it reach a crescendo where it's just like, mm. and then you're like, okay, fuck, I'm just going to sit here for a bit. Mm. 
I don't know what I'm doing next and that's okay. And I don't know what is going to come next or what this moment is about or what it's going to bring and that's okay. Mm. And just allowing ourselves to and becoming okay with simply sitting and not knowing, yeah, not having, not consuming. Um, yeah, there's something about being able to sit in that 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 space of uncertainty and that liminal mm. space, that transitional mm. space, even the vulnerability and the chrysalis that that experience is. How that space and that season can be the greatest teacher that can lead to the greatest portal, you know, that is necessary for you if you open yourself, if you stay open in it. But I think too often when it comes to separation in relationships, losing a job, the heart closes and the universe just can't work with that. You know, it's like I think Mickey Singer said something like, if you're going to go to jail for being an activist, just go with a smile and just embrace what it is. You know, you can laugh about it. Just be in it. Keep your heart open. Mm. What yeah. was coming up there was if, <laughs> if if we could if we could create a course or a university in in being in liminal space, mm. that would be incredible, right? Like it could free the world. And then what came up in response to that was we're already in that university. Yeah. Like life is offering that up all the time. All the time. Life is unknown, uncertain all the time all and the moving, time. Mm. right? Um, it's just when we allow ourselves and come to the realisation that like we don't need to be the driver of this this vehicle here. We can we have every part to play and don't need to pa- be a passive uh, bystander. Mm. However, if it, we allow ourselves to be guided by life and allow ourselves uh, or allow life to lead this dance it's not even allowing life is leading this dance whether we like it or not yeah. it's just <laughs> the issues pop up for us when we think that we should be leading instead yeah and the opposite but is I think, in- that, I think there's a tool in that it's like when you sense that resistance you can observe it for what it is mm. and like singer also says is just seeing it and then saying yes to what's happening with life and just going with the natural flow of the universe, the natural life flow, mm. you know, observing the ego. So you you were talking about having all of these different voices in your head or like not voices in it. That, that makes you sound crazy, right? If I yeah. say having all of these voices in your head, who here listening to this right now has ever heard themselves speaking or thinking in their mind, right? Mm. And how many different voices do you have? Because often we're having a, we're saying one thing, and then we notice ourselves saying that one thing, and we go, oh, "Hang on a second, Billy. Uh, why are you thinking that way? You shouldn't be thinking that way. Why are you like thinking about boobs, Billy? You shouldn't be <laughs> right." So like God's yeah. all of a sudden taking the yeah. seat of the super ego, judging your own ego, and so on. Yeah. And so there was a point that I was getting to with this, but it's left me now. Um, that's right so those voices right if we can if we can start whenever we're hearing that if the first step is just to realize oh there's a whole heap of noise going on in my head (laughs) there's all these voices and all of those voices it just the tape recordings, right, yeah. are part of the ego construct and influenced by everything and anything you've ever been exposed to, right? Like whether it's the church or whether it's yeah. teachings or dad or whatever authoritarian figure. So if they're happening in your mind and you're feeling that resistance that you were just speaking to, we can inquire and just be like, well, who is feeling that resistance? Who is it? Yeah. Like, it and, and if we start to realise that, it's just those voices, right? That's not you. Again, yeah. we were talking about ourselves oh. being that essence that is witness <laughs> to the voices. Man. Then we can all of a sudden be like, who is that? What is that? It's not us. And and so And it's kind of cute because you just go, like, it's my ego. Like, it's it's really cute. It's trying to find a way to like it's trying to help me in a way. Yeah. You know, like your ego, like I don't I don't agree sometimes when there's books like ego is the enemy, because it's not really like it's a teacher exposing insecurity and shadow and it's like you have to observe it 
Yeah. And just be like the egos looking for attachments, looking for identity. It's so cute. You know, it's just <laughs> Well, here's the thing. If you if you realize that it once it only developed in response to a situation in your life. Which means at some point in time in your life, it served you really fucking well. Yeah. But then life situations changed, but it continued on to to play out in that way, in a way, in a time where it's not useful. And so mm. I think um, the first step really is to like don't repress that ego. It's not a bad thing because you're just gonna have it following you around like mm. a bad smell. <laughs> if you're like, yeah. if you're gonna be pushing it away, you're feeding it more energy. And so really. You know those voices in your head. If you could, if you could caricature them and like draw them on a piece of paper, what would they look like? It's a, it's a really cool exercise. Um, people come up with all sorts of different totally. creatures or whatever, and yeah. and and you know, be with them throughout the day so that you can see them until you are able to communicate to them. Hey guys, you've served me well at some point, yeah. but. Right now, what you're doing or saying is not useful for this situation yeah. here, but thank you so much. Yeah. And then that, like, it's there's a beautiful processing that happens with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Osher Gensberg calls some of those voices, like, certain names. And so he's, like, Captain Catastrophe's back. Mm. And it becomes really fun. Yeah, yeah. It's like he's, like, coming in with a cape <laughs> and he's like, what's going on? He's flipping tables. Yeah. He's, like, the reptilian brain just trying to survive. yeah. yeah. Frilled neck lizard. That, um, because man, I, I feel like for some of the voices for myself, when it's come to, oh man, I, there's certain voices in my head, certain things that I've said to myself that I would never say to someone that I hated. Mm. I would never. Mm. And I think when I realized that I wasn't those thoughts and those voicings within myself, there was so much liberty because I'd feel really bad. I can't believe I said that about myself. Oh, no, but I'm talking to myself. I'm going crazy. My song Chemical is about that. Is that song came at a time of my conscious awakening where I felt like I was going crazy because mm. I was supposed to be like Jesus, perfection, but somehow I was in a lot of these anxious thoughts, more than depression, it was anxiety of just kind of like I'm thinking too much, don't think too much, but I need to think my way out of this. All these voices were coming in. I shouldn't have made that decision. Why did I do that? I know I shouldn't have. Oh, you're, oh, you're stupid. Da, da, da. And then like, no, you shouldn't have even said that you're stupid though. Don't say that. Oh, but now you're reasoning with yourself. And I was just like this constant complex conversation with myself, multiple voices, perspectives, baggage. So but um, what um, my coach and, you know, spiritual or spiritual teacher will often call that or, or liken that to because you're trying to use thought to work your way out of what thought has created. Yeah. And it's almost like trying to dry yourself with the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, what is going on here? Stuff. <laughs> oh, dude, that's bombshell right there. Yeah. yeah. You... Brother, like you said something really profound about um, space. Can you just bring up, because I just want to finish this thought around space uh, when it came to the whole analogy. Mm. Mm. Can you just surface that again? Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, say you've got, you've got the ground, you've got some soil and, and you dig up a hole. Let's just, get, let's just say you get a big scoop of dirt and then you remove that. What's now left? where that soil used to be, what's now left? Space. Mm. And so was that space not there when the soil was there? It wasn't as though you dug up the soil, removed it, and then space filled the space. Mm. Space was already there mm. with soil occupying it. Mm. And so we are space. We are that witnessing or observer or the, where there's less noise. We are that space with a whole heap of soil that's occupying that space, right? And that soil being the ego construct, the conditioning, the density of that construct, of that ego mm. construct. And so if we can, if we can really uh, realize that um, 
there has been a mistaken mm, mistaken so mistaken identity with the soil rather than the space then all of a sudden we're not that noise we are the thing from which everything was born out of every idea every thought everything you've ever achieved was born out of space not mm. the noise and so mm. um yeah it was a beautiful teaching that uh had come through from from my coach and you know that I get to deliver in a really beautiful way with with a whole heap of my clients and um you know uh, it really depends on someone's readiness to be able to receive that or hear that but um mm. being able to meet people uh uh, wherever they're at on their journey and and um mm. to have them uh to have them come a little closer to to the truth that, that is within them um mm. to that space and to to be speaking from to be feeling from to be uh to be acting from from truth which is that space which is that sense that everyone has of me mm. and not all of the things that we're doing out there trying to be me mm. um yeah that thing that already exists that was just so naturally <laughs> us when we were however old we were playing in the sandpit yeah. exactly bro i come back to that sandpit every day mm. it's like so visual vivid i didn't even care if no one remembered what my name was i was just at play group mm. with old mate that looked at, had blonde hair and we were just building something and giggling, hardly could talk, didn't matter. I wasn't self-conscious about what I was saying. I didn't know what brands I was wearing. You didn't care if a girl didn't like yeah. you. I didn't care if his <laughs> penis was bigger than mine. Like I just really didn't care. You know? It yeah. wasn't that noise and that traffic. It was just like this now. I wasn't looking at the time. I wasn't thinking about what degree I had to study. It was just like that moment. I was that moment. I was completely there. I could feel those grains of sand on my hand and I loved it. I wasn't wearing shoes, just there. And you weren't choosing to do something that you didn't feel moved to do yeah. in the moment, right? You weren't off doing something going, fuck, I wish, to, wish I didn't have yeah. to do this. Why did I choose to do yeah. this? You never chose that for yourself. No. Yeah. For sure, man. And it's like the more that I bring that spirit into my craft like mm. I live in the studio a lot of the time like five days a week at least and but it's like the fun that has come back into my craft and into my livelihood essentially mm. like I've never felt so free just being a stream of consciousness having that flow of that stream just coming out I'm just a conduit just a channel and <laughs> It's so beautiful, man. Like we were talking about before, like it, like things are just coming out and it's so intuitive and I can feel it through my third eye, through my heart chakra, through my pelvic floor. Like it's all just running through my body, but it doesn't even feel like it's mine and there's less insecurity because it's just like it is that energy and it's coming from that same spaciousness that was here before, it, you know, 14 billion years ago, before there was anything even here on this planet, before this was even here. Like it was just that same essence that same life force. And you asked me, you know, are you writing those songs? Like how did, what, is it, what does it feel like now? And I just was like, well, it's kind of like just having sex. It's like <laughs> you're there, you're not, can, you know, most of the time you're not thinking about other experiences. You're just there and there's kissing. She's doing that. You're touching her hair. Like it's just... It's sweaty, there's kissing and there's like touching this, holding that. And it's just like, it's so intuitive. And in that moment, and again, you're not looking at your watch, but it's beautiful and it's art. And, and what I'd asked you was, Billy, in that moment when that's coming through, when you're creating that music, are you sitting there also going or thinking about how to have that come through? And mm. thinking about how do I make this happen? How do I sing? The <laughs> You're not thinking about no, that, right? And, and it comes back to those voices. Like if we can just, you know, see those disturbances. But I, I literally sound crazy, man. Like I literally walk in yeah. like a little kid, so excited. And it's just like I know the intervals between notes. It's like these things are just like an extension of my hands. And I can sing stuff that I can't even sing, but someone else will be able to sing it. It's just this thing. 
And I know that there's those oversouls, there's Bowie, there's Hutchins that are looking over me and they're just like channeling stuff, whatever it is. But since I started to, to not attach my identity to my craft and just coming back to like I'm part of this one big collective energy that I share with humans, with nature, with with non-visible things of the universe and it's all just it's just all pouring through you know and what was what was that moment i'm super curious around <laughs> that moment where you you were like you were you re- either realized or made the decision to not attach your identity to your craft yeah what how did that i think happen? you guys are really important in that you say ricards were pivotal in like helping me to find you know, you're always looking for language and for template, some kind of rubric to kind of go through because I was freshly single, so sad at the beginning of 2019. It's only Mm. last year when my fiance broke up with me and like that rock bottom experience led me to kind of go deeper and like I'm not going to fucking go on Tinder, like I'm not going to go on some drunken fishing trip, you know, trying to catch marlins. Like I'm going to like really focus on my inner divinity didn't call that at the time. I started getting deeper into meditation, read a couple of books, but it was like, I think that year I began to see more and more that the more that I just sat with space was the more that I felt creative freedom. And I had this, I decided to take that year. I started to take myself so much less seriously. I started to really love myself, like deeply love being in this, mm. what some people would call a meat suit. I just mm. loved being in this. I loved my hair. I loved my smile. I loved my form. That's where that was a starting place. I began seeing trees as the most beautiful flowers that I'd ever seen. Like everything just began to awaken. Mm. I would taste a vegan pizza and it was the best vegan pizza I'd ever had, mm. even though I'd traveled the world. So things started to come alive and I think there was just that soul awakening and that chrysalis of sorts that just helped me to realise that it was so much bigger than me. It was so much this this great transcendent flow of love that was holding the universe together like I'm just part of that and I can smile and like my insignificance helped me to realise um, the significance of love and like... Because I think like my narrative was like, there's only one of me. I've got to like make the most of this life. Like, and there was so, there's some truth in that. But I think I just took myself way too seriously and I took my craft way too seriously and I attached that to my worth. Someone re- would reject the craft, they'd be rejecting me. Mm. <laughs> you know? we, were, we, we were talking about, you know, 20 minutes ago or whatever, we were talking about how a lot of what we do and a lot of the actions or things we say is on behalf of connection and looking to connect and love and so on and so on. Mm. Um, but our capacity to do so, hey, uh, mm. is fully dependent on our capacity to to love here right mm. now, mm. love love this space right now and love mm. love you right now. And, mm. and um, that's what was coming up for me as you were speaking there. It's like how... Uh, how interesting is it and curious that that uh, so many of us humans, how comfortable do you feel with saying I love myself, mm. right? And now you've been on a bit of a journey and and there's, there's probably a warmth and a fuzziness that comes with saying that now, right? Um, however, for a lot of people to say I love myself is almost cringeworthy, mm. right? To say I love me, to look in the mirror and say I love me, yeah? Yeah. And, and our capacity to love anything is fully dependent upon our capacity to love ourselves, <laughs> right? And so, like, we've got to start here. We've got to yeah. start here with the physical body And that's too, where I right? think you can give your dads a bit of grace because yeah. if they throw any non-love towards your way, it usually stems from their own lack of non-love towards themselves. You're like, mm. oh, man, I give grace to my dad. Like, mm. he's, in a, he's not in a great space. Yeah. Like, and I, yeah, yeah, it's like, fuck, he's my brother. Like I got to love on him, you know, like, yeah, it's funny. And even dude coming from the Christian world, Christians struggle with that. Like, oh, do I love myself? Oh, I'm I'm allowed. God loves me. Jesus died for me. But, but even Jesus himself said to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Like, oh, so I, I have to. To love my neighbor, I've got to love myself. There's, there's that connection. It's all connected. Mm. 
the more that I show up and love myself, meditate in the morning and feed my body great food and just like protect my temple and refresh my temple, like I can fully show up and love people vulnerably and yeah. give big dudes massive hugs and just like <laughs> and call a girl my sister if I need her. Like I can fully show up in love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's where like that's where people, um, you know, we've really learned to, uh, I guess, honour people putting themselves second, right? Yeah, in especially in Australia. <laughs> yeah, like you know, you're, you're selfless and so on, and 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 so are we actually honouring? It's not to like come down on that person, but rather support that person in in having them bring some of that attention to themselves so that they yeah. can increase their capacity to then be the best possible versions of themselves to mm. offer up that service to the world. And so, yeah, if we keep that capacity, if it's hand in hand, how much I love myself is my capacity to love others, then, oh, um, yeah. Yeah, because I think like speaking to the guys out there, like especially if you've grown up in Australia, like anywhere in the Western world, like if you were to say to someone, yeah, I love myself deeply, like you kind of, even me saying that, I think of, man, I would think of that as pride, mm. Mm. ego, arrogance, full of himself. Yeah. He, he's, just, he's just a wanker. Yeah. Like that guy is so self-obsessed. Yeah. I don't know why. That's what it conjures up for me. That, that was my past self of mm. just like, man, narcissist. I'd couple that with narcissism. And <laughs> it's like. So even today, if I ever still hear of a friend saying, yeah, man, I just don't think that they get you. Like, I get you, though. If there's, I don't get it as much as I used to, but it's just kind of like there is that bit of my old self just going, oh, yeah, I kind of shrivel up for a second. Mm. And I'm like, I used to believe that narrative all the time, but I'm like, fuck it. Yeah. Observe your thoughts, create space again, keep showing up, keep loving yourself. That's it. <laughs> 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 it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. Why do we complicate it? Yeah, bro. Um, oh, a couple of things that you've told me through the last years have really shaken me, bro. The first new kind of experience that we were at like changed my life, and mm. you really helped hold space for me, man. And we had an incredible men's circle. You were part of that, right? At the very end? No, this, oh, like second last day. Were you there with Pete Cummings? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That was so important yeah. for my journey. Yeah. But I remember going through, um, oh, what was that That maze we went through? The, uh, the labyrinth. Labyrinth. Did you do music playing? Ambience through the valley. That was like a really transcendent moment for me. Like I was mourning the loss, loss of a fiancé. Pete Cummings came into the middle of that labyrinth. We, he just held me as an elder. But, um, yeah, man, you've the universe is kind of placed in, in my space at the right times. But I remember something that you said to me really rang true and it's, I've taken it with me. I probably talk about it every two weeks to someone else. Like when me coming to terms with my relationship with my father and just ups and downs, brokenness, little bits of trauma here and there, love my dad. But like me trying to, as a soul, trying to figure out my humanity in this life. And but you're like, Billy, like, Often when sons and dads are clashing, it's ego connecting with ego. Like what does it look like when you've noticed you can connect soul to soul? Like, and, and how can you posture to speak more from that place and connect on that space? And using that kind of language that was really simple to me, I was just wondering if you could open that up, man, because that truth opened up a lot in my evolution. Yeah, and I mean uh, it was something that I had leaned into uh, for my own evolution in, in the, the evolution of my relationship with my own dad. Yeah. Right? And it, it was where I really started to realise that um, the part of me that was like really wanting him to understand or uh, that was trying to change him so that sure. he, could, he could get what I was saying or like or me trying to, yeah, basically change him so that he would understand what I was saying, um, that was my own ego, that was my own construct and the part that I was trying to change, it wasn't my actual dad, the, the, the guy that held me in his arms when I was born, that, like that there that held me with, that was unconditional love. In that moment mm. where he held me, 
I was absolutely useless as a as a butt naked baby in his mm. arms, right? Couldn't do anything, but there was absolute love for that being mm. there, right? And so that's like that is the true essence of all of us, and that was the part that I really tried to uh, see to. So I looked to see through the illusion of my dad, like my dad wasn't his thinking patterns. My dad wasn't his behavioral patterns or what he was saying or what he was doing. Mm. They, they were things he was saying or he was doing, but they're not who he is just the same yeah. way that our thoughts are not who we are. And so yeah. if I could see that as the illusion that that's the construct and that for whatever reason they were developed for him in response to something in his life somewhere, maybe when mm. he was a child, I was like, it's not my job to try and shift or change that for him and that's probably what my construct, my ego was trying to do, mm. but rather to see through it and, and, and see beyond that, to, to see the, that being uh, mm. that is that human behind, behind all of that. And, and as I started to do that, it meant that it didn't change. It didn't fucking change the situation. Like if you're talking about the situation of uh, I, what my dad would say or do, that didn't change. But all of a sudden, I wasn't trying to change that. Yeah, bro. So, but when when we have the expectation that something we do should change them all of a sudden, mm. we're setting ourselves up for failure. And so, because I was like, I wasn't looking to shift that. I was just looking to come to the realization that there's a beautiful being behind that. I was like, okay, no matter what he said in that moment, I knew that that being was behind there and and... They were just patterns and uh, behavioral mm. and thinking patterns. Yeah, and the so, word that just keeps them coming to me is just grace. Yeah. If you can like land in that space and speak and, and think and meditate from that space towards family in general, yeah, that's a game changer. Yeah. Like I think the excuses now for me when I'm like, oh, we're just so different. Like I just – so that's why I don't talk to them. Like I think you tribalize through politics, through belief systems, through religion, through footy teams. Like you kind of just – you know, but to transcend and to to speak in that space as a spiritual man and just how can I posture myself to sit and speak from my soul to their soul in a way that they can connect with. Like I remember in my Oscar trip this week, like I had some really crazy um, pictures of my dad, like it's different like terrifying animals and, you know, it was quite unsettling and I remember just asking the medicine like how can I – connect with my my dad what do I do and um I remember seeing these pictures of my dad when he was like in his early 20s just making out with my mum mm. wearing flares and having like <laughs> David Bowie mullets and just seeing that my dad was like a he's a beautiful human and I see myself in him mm. and like I literally saw my dad become me and then I was like this us and them this duality this separateness like just got smashed. I'm like, he's part of me. I'm part of him. And like when I'm, you know, hating on my dad, I'm, I'm hating on myself. Mm. And this word of unconditional love, unconditional love, surrender to it, you know. And yeah, I want to get to, um, yeah, man, how, how has ayahuasca ceremony altered and shifted and transformed your life? Yeah, it shifted it in a huge way, hey. Um, uh, up until that point, you know, there was lots of partying and, and I guess uh, my relationship with my dad had mended and improved in a big way. Mm. Um, it's funny, like, uh, as we speak here, you know, it's important to note that it wasn't my dad that just had an ego construct that had all of these behavioural or thinking patterns that weren't so useful. Uh, I had, I had. We've each got our own ego construct that's mm. that's got those patterns and so on as well. So it's you know it takes two to play, it takes two to tango. And so coming into ayahuasca, you know, you would know that you want to come into it with a bit of an intention. And mm. and you know, I had five ceremonies in the space of nine days, and the intentions I came into it with were um, to. Uh, teach me about my relationship with my mom wow. um, uh, from when my parents had divorced, uh, which was around uh, 11 or something. My relationship with my mom uh, had kind of gone a bit sour there or mm. just sort of wasn't as 
loving, I guess. Like I love my mom, but but you know that affectionate um, relationship wasn't there. Um, so there was that. There was teaching me about judgment of myself, judgment of others, mm. uh, my relationship with my brother, um, mm. and you know the uh, the first two ceremonies, nothing really. Nothing really happened. It was almost as though I was taking a while to to warm up. And then in that third ceremony, I was encouraged to, you know, they, one of the facilitators had said, um, you'll never be offered up by the medicine, by uh, ayahuasca, any more than what you can handle. Yeah. So lean into it, go for it, can go an extra dose and um, and see what, what comes up for you. And yeah, I uh, had three three cups in that one there, and um, uh, all five intentions for all five ceremonies were sorted within that third ceremony there, all wow. of them. And it was, you know, I had, uh, yeah, I, I, I one of my intentions was uh, to teach me about unconditional love, yeah. um, and show me what unconditional love was, and I didn't, I didn't experience feeling love i experienced being love as love come on like, yeah it, you know every single wave within my body um being that and it was it was such an immense energy and every what had happened in that moment was were visions of faces of every single human that i know that i could actually remember every single human and their face would come up and I would feel this immense love for them and then the next face would come up. And no joke, like every human that I know came up and it's sort of like it was like peeling away the layers of an onion but starting at the very core where it was the humans closest to me and then right up to people that, you know, receded back to when I was 12 and 10 and whatever mm. else and just feeling an absolute love for them. And, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in that ceremony, you know, and I, I can't really speak to where the messages come from. We know that psychedelics and the word psychedelic means mind manifesting. So psych meaning mind and delic manifesting. So that which already exists within your mind. So that message is coming um, from within you. But I was I was told by the medicine working with me, told me, started to teach me about my relationship with my mom and was like, mm. remember when you were 12 years old and your parents were fighting and bickering and you had that thought as a 12-year-old boy going, looking at them thinking, well, fuck, I'm going to have to do this thing called life myself. Mm. Uh, if they're doing all of, like I'm just going to have to do this myself. And that's that was the very birth, the very beginning with, what happened at 16 was just taking it to another level. That was the very beginning of the masculine uh, achiever setting goals drive that happened at, from that point onwards. But what happened with that excessive masculine, the go, 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 was like a suppression of the feminine. Mm. And at that point in time, I knew very little about masculine feminine. I didn't know them as masculine feminine energies at all, mm. right? And... Um, it had told me that because of the suppression of the feminine, my relationship with my mom, my mom putting her hand, like a motherly hand on my lower back would have me on the inside kind of like, mm, mom, wow. what are you doing, right? Yeah. There was this energy and I hated the fact that that would happen for me and I hated the fact that that would have her feel like she wasn't connected with her son and I'd see her connect with my brother in that way or whatever else but – for that to come through in that moment um, during that ceremony and then all of a sudden there was this, uh, I can't even bring words to describe the immensity of the energy that entered the left side of my body. I'm lying on my back. This energy entered my body like a jolt of lightning and my back just arched at, like whilst all of this was running through the body and it was only through the left side of my body and then the, the voice or whatever went on to say, this is the feminine within and the birth of the feminine within. Wow. Yeah. And, and I was just like, the feminine, the masculine, what is this? Like I had to Google this stuff afterwards <laughs> and then realize, oh, feminine, right side of brain, left side of body is feminine and then yeah. masculine, left side of brain and so on. And, and uh, you know, it, I walked out of that 
um, we were talking about w- whether, you know, whether in my ceremonies I was fully conscious around like where I was and so on. During that period, I was not even in Peru or in the jungle. I was elsewhere in that period. Like yeah. I, I couldn't bring, I wasn't, I couldn't bring myself to that physical reality. However, when I did start to come to and sort of, you know, w- as my eyes were open, they were seeing what actually was in front of me and so on. I would like gingerly get up and like wipe a bit of the puke off me because I'd been puking and then like felt like I was, you know, that puke was almost representative of placenta and like wiping that off of me as I was reborn and had the rebirth of the feminine within and like walking in this real gingerly state. I walked over to the shower and I'm, having this shower and it's it's 2 a.m. The ceremony had finished two hours prior, but because I had had my third cup halfway through, everyone had gone and dusted and finished and I, I kind of came out of it pretty late. I'm in the shower and I'm looking down at my hands and I was like, it's like I hadn't seen these hands before. Wow. Like just the reborn. I was just like, whoa. And um, my relationship with my mom, when I'd left the jungle there, and had the first video call with my mom. I had said words to my mom that I had never said to her in my entire life. My oh, entire life. Cry, cry. Um, I I just told her that I wanted to hug her, and I simply just wanted to hold her in my arms. And and I that might seem like something that's stock standard for a son to say to their mother. But just think for a second that I wasn't ever able to bring myself to say that to my mother. So all of a sudden, yeah. to be able to say words that I'd never said to her were that was incredibly, incredibly special. And um, uh, you know, I was like, "Yeah, cool. I've had this experience. I'm hoping it stays, but let's see, yeah. like when we get back, what it's like." And you know, every single time I hug my mom now, you know, you think back to that how I said. You know, my mum, I kind of cringed at my mum putting a motherly hand on my lower back. Every time I hug my mum now, it that hug lasts forever. <laughs> and, it's, and it's really fucking cool. And my mum's just like, I don't care what you were doing over there in the jungle. I <laughs> just like, <laughs> you know, for, for our relationship to be that. And, you know, there's still, that's a waking up experience yeah. and it shifts the neural pathways in the brain that were yeah. so well worn in, it shift those like a Did snow you feel globe. clean coming out of the, the jungle? Absolutely. Yeah. But it's crazy. It, Sorry. I, yeah. I was just going to say like from the purging, from pooing, mm. from vomiting, like I feel like my, my, even my bodily, my gut had a complete reset. It was like I walked out like a, yeah, like a, like a new, a new machine. You know, I was just like breathing, smiling, fully at ease, just yeah. like I'd lost a kilo. And just like, yeah, I don't know about for me, man. When I when I purged the first time, when I vomited, it felt like there was just demons coming out, like yeah, it, the darkest thing. Just like it was like some heavy kind of exorcism. But after that, just a deepened sense of clarity and peace and stillness that I've taken with me to this day. It's only been nearly a week, but it's just. Yeah, it's though it's it's altering to your everyday some of the things that you take some of the takeaways, mm. and I've heard some people say that it's like for them it, it sped them up like ten years of psychotherapy. Yeah, yeah, Gabor Mate is pretty famous for saying that. You know, uh, well, yeah, world renowned psychotherapist I love saying Gabor. that. Yeah, ten years of psychotherapy in one single ceremony. Hey, but like it's at the same time, it's really important. Um. You know, to mention that, like, that is, it's a state experience. It's waking up. Um, and then, you know, all, that's half the work. It's shown, like, it's mm. shown you the map. It's brought up for you where mm. the work lies for you. It's made that visible for you, which is mm. why that's half the work. This goes for coaching. This goes mm. for mm. working with psychedelics, for meditation, for whatever. If you can see the work to be done, that's half the work, right? Mm. Now you need to do the work. Mm. And the work is in the integration. So like mm. even medi- a meditative practice or a sitting practice, it's ab- like it's super useful, right? Incredibly useful. 
but insufficient in itself. Whilst a lot of like um, cultures might really put that up as the ultimate thing, and as long as you do that, but you can't really go through life. You could if you wanted to, if you'd made the choice to, but you can't go through life sitting there and mm. not engaging with life, right? So, yeah. like, can you integrate that mm. and and work that practice into? your way of living into every single little element of what you're doing in your life and how you're speaking and how you're acting. And, and that's the work. However, we use psychedelic journeys. We use mm. a meditative practice. We, um, we, we use a coach or a psychologist to, to help support us in us seeing the work to be done, mm. which is fucking awesome because most of the time we've got blind spots driving us. And when we can see the work to be done, Boom, start integrating it bit mm. by bit. I was told by a couple just before going into ceremony um, the day before, they're like, Billy, like it's going to be an incredible first experience for you um, and you're really extroverted. You're just going to want to tell everyone and I wish if I could go back, if I wouldn't just vomit out to the world everything that I experienced but really sit with it mm. and honour the integration. Mm. Diarise, have a journal with you have time alone and um and because yeah i think i think it's really true man it's like like you can sit and meditate on one leg for like four hours a day in a cave but wisdom true spiritual wisdom is seen in spontaneity Mm. it's in your every day it's things that you see it's how you're responding to reality how you're grappling with people like jesus was part of the incarnation it was the divine coming into a body Mm. with the world you know, and I think it's really important to see that, like, otherwise you just become this little spiritual elite clique where you just, you live a very monastic life, very separatist from reality. Mm, absolutely. And, uh, like, that's why if we're um, taking part in these practices, the beautiful question to ask uh, yeah. whenever something comes up for you mm. is, well, cool, what does that look like? in my life right now. Yeah. What is oh, what does dude. that look like when that is playing out in my life? And yeah. it could be something incredibly like random and mm. odd that's come up for you in ceremony. What are you trying to teach me and how does that look in my life right yeah. now? Yeah. Jung called it praxis. Praxis. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty much just a breaking down of like practically working out mm. theory, psychological psychotherapist mm. theory in your life. Mm. And I, I always ask questions when people have great lofty ideas, like, well, how does this impact people? How does it impact our connection to each other and to the planet? And mm. you don't want to live from that space, but like we we are tangible-ish beings, you know, interacting with soil, with carbon, with cells, you know, it's like bringing it back to now. And so even when some of my very Christian friends or religious friends are like, you got to study into this theory about, you know, Noah's Ark is real. They found it in Saudi Arabia. you got to go there. This little uh, uh, creation evolution. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, whoa, whoa, bro. Just really slow down. <laughs> like how does that really impact this, you know, right now? Mm. If I'm going to spend a week studying that, like how is it really going to impact the way mm. that I see ecology, economy, family? Yeah. You know, what, like th- what that brings up for me is it, but like we've spent a fair chunk of our time uh, here in this chat talking about the self in interaction, you know, with the mm. world and so on and, and working on the self. And then you've just started to touch on uh, intersubjective relations. So like relating with another, yeah. right? interrelational sort of. Um, how are we behaving with others and, and mm. how is it affecting our relationship with others? And and so um, a lot of like whatever realizations and work, self-work that we're doing with ourselves, uh, all of that is necessary, super mm. necessary. And this comes back to some of the selfishness we are speaking to. It's fucking necessary to love that self, but it's insufficient, right, to mm. only do that. Like mm. then go, okay, now that I'm working on that, how does that affect this here? Mm. How does that affect this relationship here? How does that affect my relationship with my work? So we start taking it into this objective mm. thing, but 
How does that mean that this here shows up for another? How does it mean that this here shows up for work? And mm. and how the hell does all of that fit into what we're doing the podcast? <laughs> so I'm a beautiful girl's calling. Um, how does all of that? fit into the ecology of everything yeah right into sure. the system of you know otherwise what, it's benign yeah creed it's you know? it's greater than ourselves but starts with like mm. we are the center of of our everyone's the center of their own universe right <laughs> so work on this to like expand <laughs> from this and out of this because it's like i might just be, i love reading books man podcasts i'll go to every self-help seminar love it i could live in it but like if I come out of that from doing it for six months and then I ponder my week of being back into the world, I'm like, fuck, I've really been a bastard to everyone in my life. You know, it's just kind of like observing what you're feeding your soul and, and how it beautifully blesses and um, grows your connection with other Mm. With self and with other, like it's yeah. yeah. I'm so about it, bro. Yeah, can we can we be more intentional about what we are feeding ourselves, what we are yeah, expo- sure. exposing ourselves to, yeah, and for sure, man. And that's why for me now, like I had to get off Netflix and um, because for a number of reasons, like I was, oh, it, it caused me to think a bit too much. I'm so visual. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, I had to like stop scrolling on Instagram because it kind of became like a bit of a portal for porn, mm. you know, like just for me, this isn't like I'm so impression of the world, but just my own things that stopped some evolution in me. Um, just certain things that I was feeding, even certain types of music that were just bringing out too much of a primal essence within me. And I just had to kind of like too much noise again. I'm constantly every day trying to peel back noise like unnecessary things. It's kind mm. of like when you're composting parts of your life mm. every day and just like bringing stuff to St. Vincent de Paul, you're just kind of like just creating space. And I think a shout out to the crew out there that are listening. It's like, how can we be intentional this week to create space for spaciousness? I think Eckhart Tolle says that with spaciousness comes a benediction of peace. There is peacefulness, stillness all over that. Absolutely, brother, and asking ourselves, is what I'm doing here necessary or, or useful or generative? Generative. Right? Is it generative? Is it filling the cup of here and filling the cup yeah. of another or the world or whatever yeah. else? And if it, and is it regenerative? Regenerative. Yeah. If it's generative, it's definitely going to be regenerating whatever yeah. it's coming into contact with for sure. Yeah, bro. Yeah. No, it's so good. Um, we're going to wrap it up, but, dude, that last gem, I remember a year ago you told me that there's a million, is it a million bits of information that we're encountering every second? So there's, depending on the research that you read, there's 2 million to 200 million bits of information that make up all of the information that might be coming at you as a human from a sensory perspective. And and uh, there's your conscious working mind that's per second, and so your conscious working mind uh, has a has an extremely limited capacity, right? To as to how many of those bits of information it can hold, and like you know, take a guess out of two million to two hundred million pieces that make up the whole puzzle of reality every second of stimulus that's coming your way, of information that's coming your yeah. way. How much do you feel that your conscious mind is able to hold per second, right? And you know, people throw answers out there. Hundred million out of, yeah. or like, or a hundred thousand, yeah. or whatever, or a, or it might a thousand, be. or a thousand. Yeah, or I think a I would have said something like a thousand, five hundred. Yeah, and it's it's five to seven. Our conscious mind and the capacity of it is only able to hold five to seven pieces of a puzzle that contains two million to two hundred million, which immediately means a what you're holding. It's quite biased, right? You've only got five to seven pieces of the puzzle, a quite biased perspective of reality. But it also means that every single human walking around is holding their own five to seven pieces. And all of a sudden, if it's if we bring that into the interaction with your dad, right, he's got his five to seven pieces. No fucking shit that you aren't going to 
be on the same page sometimes, <laughs> right? Yeah. Of course not. And so all of a sudden we can, yeah, put that curiosity backpack on and start exploring other people's perspectives. There was a beautiful quote that came across recently around every human is a door uh, to a new world. And whilst simple, it's super profound, hey, if we can really explore um, and, and treat each human as an opportunity to a, a whole new world, um, and to expand our own world and really get curious and mm. and explore that with humans. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be moving forward and the world will be a better place for sure. Oh, dude. Just sitting in that. You're a beautiful man, Dan. <laughs> I feel like we only just like we didn't even talk about yes and. No, we didn't. You know, yes, any of that, but part two. We kind of did in a way. Like that was all yes and. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, part two, let's yeah. do it. I think if there's a way, because I think yes and really covers just three main principles. Can you just pull apart that really, really quick? Because yeah, I think absolutely. that's, yeah, like, uh, yeah, th- what's the three prong? Yeah, three three pillars. So um, we are... We generally work with spirituality, human development, consciousness, um, and then how that feeds into uh, social entrepreneurship and work for good, and then how that feeds into regenerative and generative living. Mm. Um, we're not we're not by any means the experts or whatever else in in regenerative living or um, business for good or whatever else, but but you know our jam is um, spirituality, consciousness, human development, and and yeah, creating spaces where we can explore those. But in all of those areas, you know, people doing the work on themselves and then yeah. bringing that work into... Really coming into the ikigai mm. mantra. Because mm. yeah. I think, man, if you can hold those three things um, in balance and equilibrium, like that is a beautifully balanced thought leader, world transformer. You in know, because if you, if, if you yeah. over sit on one thing as an activist for the planet, you become very tribal. If you're just in the, in the entrepreneurship world, you become just a full-blown capitalist, just trying to capitalise on every opportunity, mm. even as a social entrepreneur. And then if you only live in the spirit world, then you kind of become a bit of a monk. You're just kind of sitting in concepts <laughs> and abstraction. And so I think it's just one beautiful thought, thought space ecology that you guys are – a sharing in, in palpable terms to the world. And I, I think I just wanted to honor you with that, man, and making these concepts that are quite deep, ancient concepts that have progressive kind of legs, you know, like there's a lot of, you know, deep thinking, big language, but you make it accessible to peasants <laughs> like myself and all around, you know, that we can we can just, you know, have it and um, you're doing a very thoughtful work, man, and um, I think the world would be a better place with more Dan Kalapskis. Thank you, brother. We've got a, we've got a beautiful team, hey, yeah. um, and I love the way that you put that and um, to, to have the opportunity to have conversations like this with people like yourself and to, mm. for Yes And to be able to play with other communities like you know, Digital Village, Starling, Starling Reunion, mm. um, uh, I think that's that's where the magic happens. So thank you so much for that, brother. Big love, bro. And um, I'm so stoked that we're neighbours now. So <laughs> how good? Yeah, yeah. dude, huge. Um, everyone out there, check out the Yes End Instagram. Dan is uh, putting on some really cool events over the next six months with his team. And um, yeah, love you, bro. Love you too, brother. Stay connected. You, you. Thank you for listening to the Beginning of Us podcast. This podcast is created on Bundjalung land, just south of Byron Bay. We pay our respects to the original custodians of this land. If this episode has connected with you, please leave a comment, share the episode on your Instagram stories, and subscribe to this podcast. We'd love to hear from you. The Beginning of Us is produced by Billy Otto. The theme music is by Billy Otto and Khalid Tusker. Technical direction by Eliash Perez. Find out all about Billy's many mindful projects and music by Instagram at, at Billy Otto. Blessings to you and namaste.